back into Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, continuing in the series that I've entitled The Ultimate Basis for Creation Science. This will be part six, day five of the six days of creation. So that means that we'll have at least one more, and as I've looked ahead, I'm not sure I can do it in one more time. So we'll just have to see how that works out. Uh, there's a lot. Obviously, the next day is the creation of man, and that in itself is a significant uh, area of study. But part of that that I think has very definite relevance to the age in which we live in is the mandate that God gives to humanity, all of mankind. And I'd like to devote some attention to that because I think it, uh, it has an effect not only on science, but uh, basically every area of life and every area of a culture. So it's an extremely important area. Now, I hope you've been picking up as we've been moving through these days of creation. I've been touching very briefly on many different aspects, not just, not just the biblical text, but we've also looked at uh, different aspects that touch almost every area of life. And, and it would be my contention that if you study the early chapters of Genesis, you can find a basis for every area of life and culture. Now, we've looked at areas of physics. Tonight, we're going to kind of concentrate a little bit on biology. Now, I'm not a biologist, but... Uh, I play one on TV show, maybe, <laughs> not really. Uh, but not just the sciences. Uh, we touched on the idea that uh, even language, if you think of linguistics and language, where does language come, for, come from? We have a biblical basis and the origin of language in the very first day and actually the very first words of, of, of day one. And God said, God speaks. That's the origin of language. And there are a lot of implications we can draw, and I gave you several of them when we looked at day one. And I don't think that you can come up with any area of study or any area of culture or any area that touches our lives directly that do not have a basis in Genesis 1 through 11. You have the origin of the nations later on. You have uh, the origin of the nation of Israel. So you have all of that. You have the origin of prophecy. You have, everything has its basis. And I would encourage you, no matter what area, if you have children or no matter if you've uh, studied in university, obviously, to think in terms, of, in fact, we should renew our thinking, renew our minds, and shape them according to what God has revealed because we have a biblical basis for everything. Uh, even politics, you can find that in, uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, it touches on uh, dealing with every area of culture. So I'd like to continue with our study. Uh, this is perhaps why Henry Morris says that this is the most important book ever written just because it is the basis for everything. Not just the basis of all creation, but the basis of every area of endeavor that you can imagine. So, uh, a very important book. We've looked at uh, the first few days. The, you can, the structure of the six days can be broken into two parts in general. Now, it does break down in day three. It's not a clean... Uh, structure, like uh, those in the framework hypotheses uh, try to put forward. There's a few things in there that even go against this framework. But I think uh, it appears that from verse 2, when it speaks of the earth being formless and void, the first three days, I believe the concentration and the emphasis of those days is God is giving form to the creation. And he gives form by introducing light, day one, uh, introducing the sky or the firmament, as it's translated in some translations, or we might even say space or the universe, 
is separated. Waters are separated, and in that I gave you a couple of views of what that could be, uh, what, what could be in view there. Day three, we have uh, plants and animals, or plant, uh, land and plants, rather. We have the origin of life. In fact, the point to make there is life did not come about in the oceans, as the evolutionist will try to tell you. Life came about as a re result of God's miraculous creative hand on day three on land. He planted vegetation. We also, in the second half, it, it appears that the focus is God is now filling that that he has given form to. And there's some parallel, parallels. On day four, God puts the lights, the great lights and the lesser lights in the heavens. And then remember last time we talked about day four. And almost as a side note, he also created the stars. And when we look at the stars, uh, it, it's just un, unimaginable the, 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 the size of the universe and the... Uh, uh, just the glory of God that can be revealed as a result of studying astronomy and astrophysics. So we looked at that area, so we studied astrophysics a little bit last time. Today we're going to focus on the fowl and the fish, or birds and uh, creeping things, or swarming beings. We'll look at that area, and then eventually we'll look at animals and man on day six. So this is kind of an overview. So day four, one through four, day one, uh, one of the implications, and this is huge, this is major, one of the things that distinguishes what we believe as those committed to Scripture and what some would even say every other thought or every other uh, humanistic idea is the idea that there is a Creator that is distinct from His creation. Now, if you evaluate all of the pagan religions, all of them mix those two up. All of the gods are somewhat related to the creation. And in fact, for example, in Enuma Elish, the gods there have this battle. And as a result of the battle and the death of one, the blood produces certain things in the universe and the body, other things. So there's... There's a continuity of being, you might say, between the creation and the gods. The Bible is very different. We believe in a transcendent God that is distinct and separate and self-existent, has no need for the creation. So that was one of the major uh, implications we drew there. I also emphasized uh, the idea of God speaking and the concept of God speaking things into existence. That was the mechanism that God used. He spoke things into existence. There's all kinds of implications. We talked about the concept that uh, language is, uh, has information content, uh, the essential nature of language. And when God speaks things into existence, He has built information into that that He has created. And that information reveals something of himself. That's why we can look at the creation and see something of God. That's what Romans 1 tells us. That's what uh, Psalm 19. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. And there's several other passages. So when you look at the creation, you ought to be see, seeing evidence of the creator because he has built and put information in the creation. So day one starts that off. Day two, God stretches the heavens and we emphasize the aspect of time on, uh, on looking at that day. He stretches the heavens, use some of uh, Russ Humphrey's uh, ideas and theories. Day three, we saw the land masses and the origin of life. I mentioned on that already. And then day four, heavenly bodies. And some of the emphasis on the heavenly bodies was a refutation of not only theistic evolution, but progressive theism, and also the uh, framework hypotheses. I've been weaving in, as we've studied some of these things, uh, refutation of pagan ideas, 
refutation of false religions, refutation of uh, evolutionary ideas as we worked our way through here. And I think many of these were intended by Moses, not, not so much the more recent uh, issues in our culture, but uh, very definitely, I think uh, Genesis 1 is a polemic against uh, the cultures in which the Israelites were not only coming out of, but also the cultures that the Israelites would be going into, and there's a lot of reputation concerning the gods. We'll see some more of that even on day five. So that's a little bit of a review. The pattern is similar in day five as what we've seen, so the outline is very similar. By the way, I did I didn't pass out the outline sheet. Do you want to get that out, Jerry? Thank you. I've got the outline sheet on that as well as uh, a few other notes there. It begins with a statement concerning revelation. Every one of the days begins in a similar way, and God said. Vayomer Elohim, since Jerry started off our time with Hebrew, we might as well continue. Uh, that is characteristic of each of the days. What it tells us, it's not a stylistic note. It, it's not there uh, to give the idea of poetic evidence. Uh, I think it's there for emphasis. This is clearly historical narrative. In fact, one of our sessions I, I devoted to some of the evidence in the text that tells us this is historical narrative. This is not poetic literature. This is historic nar narrative. This is a story of how God put all of things together, how God created. And it begins uh, with this idea that is reiterated over and over. And in the text, you see it in verse 3, you see it in verse no, uh, 6, you see it in verse 9, and you see it in verse 11, and now we see it well, in verse 20, uh, also verse 14, you'll see it in verse 24, 26, 28, and 29, God revealing, God speaking. And then he speaks the creation into being. The next thing is the actual articulation of that revelation. And in the text, I forgot to open up my Bible here. Let's follow what the text says, and then we'll bring out the specific points. Then God said... Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Now, the articulation continues through the rest of the verse. And let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And then it uh, follows with uh, the note that God created in verse 21. So the articulation goes through the end of uh, verse 21.